morning and welcome to our quarterly vi vir virtual estate planning webinar. We are so delighted to have so many joining us today, over 300 registrations. Uh, my name is Cindy Sherrick and I'm the Director of Donor Relations at the King County Library System Foundation. And joining me today is my friend and colleague, Kara McDonald from the Seattle Public Library Foundation. Together, our two library systems have been offering webinars as just one service to our supporters and the broader public. We've been collaborating now for over three years, and this is just one example of how our two organizations often work together to increase the public's access to free library programs. Thanks, Cindy, and hi, everybody. I'm going to run through a few items of note for today's webinar. First, all of our guests are muted and all of our cameras are off other than our panelists to limit background noise and distraction. Uh, we are recording today's presentation and we will send a link to the recording as well as to Mark's slides after we wrap up today. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time for a live Q&A with Mark and Cindy and I will pose those questions on your behalf. And to ask a question at any point, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, or if you're using an iPhone or iPad or other tablet, it might be at the top of your screen. So just look for that Q&A button and put your questions there and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time that we have. You'll also see a chat feature, um, which some of our staff members will moderate. So if you have any technical questions or issues with accessing today's webinar, you can put a chat in there and you'll get immediate assistance. Um, if there are questions you have today that don't get answered by Mark, um, you'll find contact information for everyone you're hearing from today at the end of the presentation. And again, we will be sending a follow-up email after this. And we're happy to connect with you one-on-one -on -one anytime to answer any questions you might have as well. Both of our foundations support library programs beyond what public funding alone supports. And even though our physical spaces are closed right now, our libraries do continue to serve the public from a distance. Our foundations are working hard to keep virtual services going. We're helping fund virtual library cards to keep people to give people immediate access to collections. We're funding expanded ebook collections to keep people connected to the books that they love. We're supporting services to help job seekers and small business owners. And both of our libraries have special programs to serve older adults, which is a growing part of our work as the library aims to serve all people at all stages of their life. Since this is a planned giving seminar, it's worth noting that some of the most generous and transformational gifts have come through bequests. And one example is the estate of a wonderful supporter named Susan Ash. Susan chose to give a substantial gift that benefited both of our organizations, and it ensures that public libraries will remain strong and vital for years to come. Susan Ash's legacy ensures that our library can continue serving individuals with the greatest barriers and provide them with every opportunity to succeed. Yeah, Cindy, and adding on to that great story, you know, just the other day we had a donor who'd been giving to us for more than 20 years and they generously left us a gift in their will to buy more books because books are what brought them joy in their life. So it's, we're just so grateful that we can work with donors like that to help them get those gifts in place. And for many people, planning for the future like that can be intimidating and confusing, especially right now. Um, but it's certainly that's something that's on people's minds. We learned that Google searches for how to make her will are up over 50%. So if you're thinking about this, you're not alone. And when it comes to estate planning, there's so much to consider, legal questions, distribution of possessions, questions about how to leave a legacy gift to a charity that you might want to support. And today, Mark will be giving an overview of how to best approach those things. The goal of our libraries remains simple, to offer people access to information, ideas, and resources. And that's what we're doing today. We're making a connection to this wonderful professional who's donating his time and expertise to help you. And both of our libraries have excellent books and resources on plan giving available in our respective collections. And if we were doing this event in person, uh, we'd have those books for you in the back of the room to look through. But since we're doing this virtually, we're going to have to send you a list of those e-materials after today's event. And in addition, Cindy and I are always available to support you should the library be a part of your charitable legacy plans. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Mark has been with the Rayburg Law Group since 2009, and he is the firm's co-owner. He received a master's degree from Indiana University in 1986 and graduated with a Juris Doctorate degree from Northwestern University School of Law in 1991. 
He's a member of the Washington State Bar Association and has spoken spoken a number of seminars and bar sponsored trainings in both Illinois and Washington State. He was selected by his peers as a rising star in Washington Law and Politics Magazine. He's a member of the East King County Estate Planning Council. And for fun, he enjoys theater. He's a history buff and he loves to camp with his wife, Donna. So Mark is gonna go ahead and fire up his presentation now. And I wanna welcome you, Mark. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Cindy and Kara. I appreciate your generous introduction. And I do encourage all of you to consider the foundations of both libraries during this time, both dark in fact and dark in metaphor, where we are struggling, all of us, with trying to get good information, trying to find a path through what can be a difficult time in our own thoughts and our own discussions, things like that. It can be a great resource that you have, the books, the articles, the, the you know, all the different things that are provided by the libraries. And we often will have people who will remember uh, both foundations in their wills, as was already pointed out, because they loved reading or they love the library or they just feel like this is something that is a light, one of those lights in the darkness for our democracy at this time, very, very important. Again, my name is Mark Reinhardt. I'm an attorney with Reberg Law Group, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about estate planning at this time. And I love the title that was given to this. It wasn't my idea, but it was given to me by one of the two hosts, and that is inconceivable. So as a background, it's important to realize that what we're gonna talk about when we talk about estate planning, we often think about, well, do I have a will or not? And that was one of the questions you saw in the slideshow at the beginning was, you know, how many percentage of people did not have a will when they died? That's part of the discussion we're gonna be having, but there are other documents as well, other ways to take care of you and your loved ones to help them take care of you. And then also, of course, have documents to transfer things after you die with the least amount of fuss and bother and difficulty and agony for everyone. So we wanna keep those two ideas in mind. The two sides of the coin would be what to do after death but obviously what to do while you're still around. And some of you had questions on those types of things already. Now, right now, it's unfortunate, but I have a number of people who will come and ask me. They know what I do. Mark, you're an estate planning attorney. Yes. Do you help people after someone has died? Yes. I help the families. And they say, have you seen a lot more deaths from COVID-19? Is that causing a great bump in the amount of business that you have? And in part, yes. But what I found actually is right now, there's a lot of other reasons that this topic is really important. It's not just those direct deaths from COVID-19. And we've unfortunately had to do some probates for people who've lost their lives in that. But also other people who are delaying or deferring treatment for other things. And then not least is just sheer loneliness. A lot of uh, seniors or elderly who are inside their homes or inside of an institution, they're not able to get out. Their family's not able to see them. And unfortunately, we're finding that is a big part of why it seems that at this time, the deaths are indeed going up. So this is definitely an important topic. The goals that we have for this is to give you information, give you resources, and you're gonna have a number of things available to you, both in this slideshow and also in, uh, you know, giving you that those uh, list of resources that are available, but also uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during this time. So please feel free to go ahead and ask those questions. All right, where are we going with this? Well, we want to make sure that as we talk about all of these things in a legal way, that we'll talk about directives to physicians and powers of attorney and living trusts and wills. But I wanna make sure that we don't forget, right? We're, we're saying in a way for this seminar, what if you only had a little bit of time? You suddenly got that bad news, right? Now I, I only have a few days or something bad is happening. I need to take care of everything. I wanna encourage you to take care of first things first. 
Try to take some time, think about what's important to you, whether that's family or friends or faith or other kinds of things in your life, charities and, and causes. Think about those things so that you can take stock of the big picture. So that if indeed we only had a couple of days or a week to try to get everything taken care of, you don't forget about what's the most important for all of us, those other types of things. So if it was the case where you can't, didn't have much time, right? Uh, you got that bad diagnosis and or a friend or a family member, what could they do really, really quickly? There's a number of things that we can do that won't take that much time at all. It might take uh, a few hours for some things or a few days or a few weeks, but it depends on what we're trying to do. The first thing that most people often forget about is making sure that their accounts and assets are titled properly. So in other words, if you have a retirement account, have you checked who the beneficiaries are lately? If you don't, and there are no beneficiaries, maybe it was you each had spouse first, but then one spouse died and now you forgot to add on anybody, or you had a beneficiary listed and they died before you. If there's nobody on that account, that account is gonna go through all kinds of difficulties to get to the next person or whoever it may be. And of course, you'll have no ability to decide who gets these things next. So there'll be retirement accounts. There might also be bank accounts that are joint with someone, maybe spouse that's joint with right of survivorship. So those things are going to transfer over to the survivor. Now, those would be things you can do quickly. Just double check all of your titling. Make sure that those accounts, especially retirement accounts, have beneficiary designations on them. You'll also, of course, if they're, you're married, there may be a document you could put together rather quickly, and I will have this uh, maybe one or two times a year where one of the spouses realizes they find out they're going to die. It's going to be, unfortunately, very quick, and they can put together what's called a community property agreement with each other. This community property agreement says, basically, when one of us dies, everything will transfer using this community property agreement to the survivor. And that could be a very easy way for any Washington state assets to transfer over to the survivor. We won't have to do a court, uh, you know, any kind of court process or anything like that. We can use that document and probably 90% of the time that will be uh, honored by the institution or the county recorder if there's land in order to transfer things over. But keep in mind, if you have assets like real property or mineral rights or maybe even a timeshare in another state, a Washington State Community Property Agreement won't work there. It's going to be very much only for Washington State assets. There are also wills that can be put together relatively quickly. And a will, as was pointed out in one of the earlier slides, can give you control. They can avoid a mess. They can say, here's who's going to be in charge when I'm gone. That would be the executor or the modern phrase is a personal representative. They can also say where things go. And we'll look a little bit here and there about how do things go to people. So all those things can be done in a will. A will can be put together, as I said, very, very quickly. One thing you need to be aware of, however, and is a surprise to many people, and that is when you use a will, almost certainly there will be a probate. So after you die, your personal representative, your executor goes to the bank, something's got your name on it, an account, or they go to the title company because they want to sell your home. Your name is on the deed. What will happen is that institution is going to tell your executor, look, I'm sorry, that may or may not be the right will. You may or may not be the right person, but you're going to have to go to court and get some magic pieces of paper. These are called letters testamentary. And those magic pieces of paper, those are what gives your executor the authority to take control of things that are in your name 
and then carry out your wishes, transfer them to where they need to go. So wills can be put together very, very quickly as well, but there are also those documents that you'll really want to make sure you have now for the here and now. And those would be powers of attorney. There would be a power of attorney for healthcare matters, who can make medical decisions for you if you can't, and who also can make financial decisions for you. We like having those documents as two separate documents. So that way, if you've got one child who's maybe in a nursing or medical field, or you have a friend who, who is a doctor, whatever, you can put the right person in to make the healthcare decisions but then maybe you've got someone who really is savvy financially. You can have them put together uh, and be your agent under your power of attorney for your financial power of attorney. All those different things, then you can make sure you've got the right person in charge. Those things can be put together very quickly as well. By the way, if you have these things, you wanna go back and look at them and make sure they're not too old. Generally speaking, if you've got a will and you put it together maybe before 2005 or six, it may be problematic because there's been a lot of changes in the estate tax laws since 2006, especially if you're married. And if you have powers of attorney, we had a 2017 Power of Attorney Act that changed quite a few things here in Washington state. And a power of attorney is uh, very much uh, liable to be dishonored by an institution. It sounds incredible, but your power of attorney, your agent's trying to do something for you, they're going to have to send a copy of that power of attorney off to whatever institution they're trying to get to honor it so they can take care of you and take care of things for you. And it's not unheard of that that power of attorney will be rejected. And that institution says it's too old or it doesn't say exactly the things that are trying to be done. So generally speaking, your powers of attorney should be five years old or newer. And that can really be a surprise. You don't wanna let somebody try to use the power of attorney. It's rejected. Then they have to go through court process or you know other things in order to get that power of attorney to be honored. Finally, there is a directive to physicians, and that directive says what you want under end-of-life circumstances. Basically, in Washington, there are two triggers. One trigger is if death is imminent, so hours or days, and two doctors will say there's really no hope, or the other trigger condition is you're brain dead or permanently unconscious, persistent vegetative state, and again, two doctors say, really no hope, then it's better for you to say in advance, this is what I would like. When they, you can kind of go from a spectrum all the way from do the least, withdraw treatment, but make me comfortable, give me palliative care, drugs for pain. Uh, maybe you want artificial hydration if that's being provided. In addition to that, maybe artificial nutrition as well. And some people say, give me the works, I want heroic measures. But all of those documents, you want to make sure you have available now, and they can be put together very, very quickly. You don't want to wait for these. If you get near death or you're incapacitated, of course, then you're not going to be able to put something together. And it may not be, uh, there may not be enough time. It's probably two or three times a year I have people call and their parent or, you know, someone's in the hospital they're near death and they say, oh, we need this really quickly. The doctors say, I need a power of attorney. But if that person, the patient, can't actually sign or they don't know what they're signing, they don't have mental capacity, or of course, if they're dead, they're not going to be able to put together any kinds of documents like that. So the main thing here to know is make sure that your documents are up to date. A couple questions I want to tackle while we're here. One person asked if they've got some Maryland documents. Can they continue to use those? The answer is the Maryland will will be valid here. It should be honored here as long as it was properly put together in Maryland. But 
I would encourage you to consider look having an attorney here in Washington take a look at it. Maryland is not a community property state, and of course, Washington is, and those can lead to giant differences. Maryland, I don't know if they've got an estate tax, but certainly Washington does, and that may also lead to enormous differences in how we would want to look at the will and whether or not it would last or not. Then we've got a question about updating a last will and testament. Uh, it was done when their son was 19. And of course, they, you know, depending on how old they are now, again, I would say about every four or five years, just have them review. Do what we call a checkup appointment. We don't charge for checkup appointments. We'll just kind of say, here's what this says. Here's some suggestions. Um, but four or five years, or if there's changes in the family. Certainly, if there's changes in the people you named as agents or executors. Also, if there's changes in people you've named, birth, marriage, divorce, in-law becomes an outlaw, of course, death. And you'll always want to make sure you have backups to anyone that you've named. If this person can't serve, then this is who serves. Or if that person is dead, then the, their share goes to this other particular person. And finally, there was a question about directives. Uh, the directive to physicians we just talked about, how does that fit in? They are that end of life document. So you walk into the hospital and you're able to tell the doctors what you want. When you can't communicate with them, then your power of attorney for healthcare, the agent you've named would be the person that you would uh, have making decisions on your behalf. But those end of life situations where if the doctors withdraw treatment, it might lead to your death, that's when we need the directive to physicians. I have literally had situations where the doctors would not listen, would not honor the uh, wife's or the spouses, or even if all the kids are in agreement. So you wanna have those things in advance. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Now that's what you can do quickly, but you also wanna make sure that you're helping other people help you. So you wanna start thinking about who are the people to contact if you die? And there's all kinds of resources for this. I think the library will have many. Uh, our clients, we give them a binder and there's all kinds of information for you to fill out. Who to contact if something happens. Maybe you want to make sure they know the attorney who put it together and their information. Or you want to make sure that they know about your financial planner or your, your you know, clergy. Or you want to make sure that they know about uh, you know, who might be your CPA or something like that. And you can should write all of those things down for people in advance. So if something happens to you, they can immediately know who are the people helping you. Where you keep important documents is also going to be really, really helpful. <laughs> you want to, of course, whoever you've named as your executor or your agent, you want to let them know where you're, keep, you're keeping these documents in your home. Now, sometimes the attorneys keep all the originals. I'm not in favor of that because attorneys have this odd tendency to retire or die. In fact, in Washington state, they've said about two thirds of us in the next five years or 10 years will retire or die, which sounds like the start of a joke, but that's actually true. And if your attorney dies and they've got your original will, it's often the case where nobody knows where the heck the will went after that attorney's gone. So make sure you have access to your own originals. Where do you keep them? Let other people know about that. This is where I keep it in the house. Uh, you'll also want to make sure that people know if you've got maybe an IRA. Where do you keep that documentation? Insurance, where is that documentation? Especially if you have any kind of funeral or burial plan. Let people know in advance where are those documents so that, you know, People come in, they don't know where anything is, they pick out all the, the arrangements, the flowers, the funeral, and then two weeks later, they're looking through your paperwork and go, oops, they wanted to be cremated. We don't want that to happen. Uh, you wanna also make sure that people can figure out how to get access to your digital accounts and assets. This is a tricky topic because 
Washington State does have a digital accounts, uh, digital assets act that will say that your executor or your power of attorney has the ability to take control of those things. That might be things like your photos, your music, different kinds of things that you stored online. <laughs> but if they can't get into it, that's a bit of a problem. So you'll want to come up with a way that you feel comfortable giving someone else access when they need it to your digital accounts. It might be a password protected document. It might be a thumb drive you give them. You know, it's not unheard of that people will write those things down, but be very, very careful. Of course, you don't want to tell anyone about your Bitcoin fortune and then uh, suddenly that piece of paper goes missing. You'll also want to consider uh, giving biographical information to your next in line so that number one, maybe they can share with others, but number two, there's enough information there for them to know what would be on your death certificate, which is a little macabre or creepy to fill out now. But better you let people know, this is where I you know, was born, here's the date, here's when I married, here's my level of education, so that people don't get that incorrect. If a death certificate is filled out incorrectly, it takes a couple weeks to correct, especially during this time of COVID. And everything on your arrangements after you're gone is pretty much at a standstill until that death certificate is corrected. And as I said, you'll want to make sure that people know your burial and funeral arrangements and wishes over and over again. It is very unfortunate, but it's a time of grief and shock and stress and emotion. And if you don't put all these things down to help other people help you, it's pretty likely people might forget or they might have their own ideas and people will start fighting. And for almost all of us, the last thing we want is for our loved ones to be fighting after we're gone instead of coming together. So be aware all those things are going to be there, right? If you put them together and let your next in line know where they are. Let's deal with another couple questions so I don't fall too far behind. I've got a question, how do I best set aside an inheritance for grandchildren when assets are in IRAs. I would strongly encourage you to go see an attorney on that because I've had a situation where a grandfather left IRAs to his minor, in other words, under 18 grandchildren. And the institution, the IRA custodian said, well, they're underage, so they can't have the IRA. Grandfather died, now we're not able to, to make sure who gets the IRA. We had to go to court to clear that up. Oddly enough, we had to get their own parents. Grandfather died, but parents are living of those children. We had to get the parents declared as guardians of their own children in a court order. So I'd encourage you, be very careful when you're trying to do that. You will want to contact that institution at the very least and say, this is the issue. Do you have a custodial arrangement, a custodianship? What do you recommend? But an attorney is probably a good bet for that. The question from another person saying, when do you create a living trust versus a will? And we're going to deal with that uh, in a couple slides, but let's talk about it briefly. Basically, a living trust is a document that's designed to avoid probate. And it does that by having you change your assets with uh, and retitle things now, not all of them, but many of them. And it does that then if your name isn't on it, the trust name is on it, that means we don't have to do a probate after you're gone. Probate is time, effort, money, usually about two to 4% of whatever's there is gonna be sucked up in fees, if not more, many times it is more depending on who the attorney is. So you wanna make sure, right, you're thinking about this wisely. Have the attorney give you a fee quote on each one so you can decide what makes the most sense. Usually a living trust is chosen if people are concerned about a, any publicity. A probate is a public uh, you know, court proceeding, of course. If they're worried about people maybe challenging, much more difficult to challenge a living trust because it's not in a, in a court already. 
and maybe they have assets in more than one state. They've got real property in Idaho or mineral rights in Oklahoma, or they've got a second home in California. You don't want to probate in two different states, which would be what happens when you have real property in two states. So that would be a question, right, to kind of think through with your attorney what makes the most sense. Uh, question about whether we have anyone in our firm with property and pensions in more than one country. The answer to that, unfortunately, is no. Usually you're looking to the, ins the institution or an attorney in that country because they're going to be more familiar. But uh, if you want to forward me that question by email, there's a contact information. I can try to forward you someone else. We do have some contacts in other countries, uh, not least Canada where many people have across border assets. Let's talk about what to do. So what to do is important, but what not to do when you're in a rush, when you're trying to maybe save money, and I get it, that makes sense, but we wanna make sure we don't make things worse. And one of the things that can make things worse is when we try to, to scrimp on things or we try to rush it through. So you can definitely make some mistakes with do-it-yourself plans. I think that libraries are very good. They have a free will program that they offer, but you want to make sure if you have any unusual issues, whether that's an estate tax issue, whether that's any beneficiary issues, if there's anything that's even slightly out of, I want it to go, here it is, everybody gets everything immediately, you probably want to maybe use that as a resource, but then use that as a means to talk to an attorney. I often will unfortunately find people with do-it-yourself plans, whether it's you know online or in a book, whether it's, you know, they copied their friend's uh, will or living trust. It's very easy to make a mistake when, frankly, you don't know really what you're doing. People can make mistakes that they don't think about the estate tax consequences. They don't, maybe that there isn't an estate tax wherever that other person had their will or wherever the author who wrote the book was from. Uh, they may not have community property agreements that are offered in those states. So you'll want to be really, really care, we, uh, careful. I've had crazy mistakes people have made where they thought they had done everything right and they forgot to have witnesses. They, they didn't have any, uh, they didn't have a, maybe a notary instead, or they didn't have, the, they had a, one of their kids was a, was a witness. So they didn't sign, they forgot, or they just thought, oh, I'll just sign it later, and they never did. So all those things, if it isn't done right, and you don't know what words mean, like residue or remainder or personal property or personal effects, you can make some awful mistakes. And if you're not around, which you won't be when we look at the will and decide who's going to be the personal representative and how to take care of things, then it's too late. That'll usually mean people start fighting. It'll, it usually means we may have a heck of a time getting that into court. I had a situation where uh, the will didn't have what's called a remainder clause, which means I'm giving these certain things to these people. Everything else is supposed to go this way. They didn't write anything down. They just forgot it. And so it was supposed to all go to wife, but because it didn't say that, we had to use some state statutes about where things went next. The end result is wife did not get it all. She got part of it and children got part of it, or others may get part of it. So you got to be really careful. Obviously, you can make mistakes with titling. If you try to start saying, I'm going to, everything is going to be a beneficiary, or I'm going to put joint with right of survivorship on everything. You have to be really careful, because that means you're giving someone else rights, maybe to your home, while you're still living. If you've signed over half the house to them, there could be gift tax consequences. And also, of course, if they get in an accident um, and they're sued and then or they're in a divorce, somebody else can look and go, aha, part of that house is that person's. I want to take that value, even though it's your house. There are mistakes you can make if you just try to give things away. I don't want to deal with it. I'm going to give it all again. 
what happens if they are in an accident, the person you gave it to. But there's also some tax advantages, believe it or not. When you die, everything gets what's called a step up in basis, which means it gets a new date of death basis value. If you bought your home for 250000 now it's worth seven hundred and fifty. If you die with the home, the new owner, the new the person who inherited it, they get a basis of 750000 So they don't have to worry so much about capital gains if they need to sell the house. If you give the house away, they get the same basis you did. So they have a 250000 basis, what you paid for the house. And if they sell it, now they're going to have a big capital gains problem. All this, of course, is not as bad and typically is the worst mistake, which is doing nothing. You definitely don't want to just sit there and try not to do anything. Let's deal with a few more questions then while we march along. Uh, there's a question about what triggers the use of any powers of attorney that depends upon the language in the power of attorney. Many powers of attorney and all healthcare powers of attorney will say, this is only effective if I, under these special circumstances, typically you're incapacitated. So that means you're incapacitated, you're not able to handle your finances, then someone else can come in and take over. But there is a slight gotcha there. It takes time to prove incapacity typically a trip or two or more to the doctor's office. And I've literally had people come to me, say, Mark, I'm mom's power of attorney. What do I do? I, the banks won't let me take care of mom's bills. And I look at the power of attorney and it says, this is only effective upon incapacity. And so we look at the terms and say, well, you're gonna need two doctors to certify to incapacity, which is very difficult to do right now during COVID. And the doctors are a little busy right now, including trying to make an appointment. So there's also another way, which is a power of attorney that's effective immediately. So that would be obviously for people you trust, but frankly, if you don't trust them, maybe you shouldn't have named them. But you're going to want to talk about that. People have different ideas about which one they may like, whether it springs through uh, to life immediately or it springs to life only after you become incapacitated. There's a question about, is it possible to set up letters testamentary before you die? And the answer is no, not in Washington state. The only way you can get it is after you're dead. In fact, there needs to be an original death certificate. There have been a uh, couple cases of fraud here where someone started a probate and the person wasn't dead. So now there is a requirement, right? You're dead, there is a death certificate, then we can you know, start the probate. That might be a situation where a living trust, a living trust springs to life when you sign it. So it's around while you're around. Whereas a will doesn't spring to life till after you die. And we'll look at that in a minute. Do documents from Compassionate Choices Washington still qualify as legal? It depends on the type of document. Typically, uh, some documents are, they, they say that they're legal if they're signed. Um, I typically say use them with a great deal of caution, of course, because you want to make sure they didn't, you already have a power of attorney and you're accidentally revoking earlier powers of attorney you have. So you're going to want to look at those documents and see, do they say, you know, this is legally enforceable. Typically, you'll know that if they're asking for witnesses or a notary public. Uh, question on how do you witness a will? Um, basically, in Washington State, you're going to need two independent witnesses. You're going to need some magic language that certifies that they saw you sign this. Oftentimes, there'll be a notary public involved as well to notarize the document. So I guess with a great deal of care and, and be really careful when you do that. So let's move on then to how to use an unexpected reprieve. We've got probate avoidance with a living trust. Let's suppose that you have more than just a few days or months. Instead, right, maybe you've got a little bit longer, which hopefully most of us have. We've talked a little bit about a living trust. A living trust is an alternate vehicle to a will. Basically, a living trust can do all the things a will can do. It can say, here's where things go, and here's how, and, and here's who's in charge. But the living trust, you are retitling many of your assets 
now into the name of your living trust. Now you're still in control. That means you're in charge of it. You can amend it and change it and revoke it. You're managing all the assets that you are just like now. But after you die or become incapacitated, your successor, called a trustee, the next person in line, can take over a lot more easily than having to go through a court process, whether a guardianship process if you're still alive or a probate after you're gone. And as we talked about, if you want privacy, you wanna make sure that it's harder to challenge if maybe there's some questionable relatives out there, or you just don't wanna have multiple probates. You wanna make things relatively easy for your loved ones, your spouse, others, then a living trust may be the right answer. The negative of a living trust is it is going to be more expensive to set up now. It's a much more complete document. And there need to be careful retitling of various assets to make sure that it works right. Estate tax planning, right? Now this is something Washington State, we're one of the few states, a little bit less than a third have an estate tax. An estate tax is a tax on anything that's over a certain amount of assets after you die. The estate tax covers just about any assets you own. That's your house, your retirement accounts, your life insurance, anything that you have control of or possession or you're getting income from, you, you're probably going to see that as part of your taxable estate. Washington State says if you die and you have more than 2.193 million, so just a little bit under 2.2 million, then anything above that gets taxed at a 10 to 20% rate. So one of the mistakes that can be made with a married couple who move, let's say from Maryland, is they everything goes to the survivor. But if the first to die, right, if they die, maybe they've got 2 million of their own assets and their surviving spouse has a million or 2 million, the first spouse to die, they didn't use their own get out of tax free card of 2.2 million. They gave everything to spouse. That's called a marital deduction. But if that means the spouse dies, they have three, four million. They're over 2.2 million. There will be a tax on everything above that number before it goes down to the kids or whoever it goes to next. So estate tax planning in Washington is very, very important. And it's a pretty low number when you think about the way that uh, property has gone up in value here. Retire the market, fortunately, knock on wood, has generally gone up, but it includes things we don't expect, things like retirement accounts, things like your bank accounts, things like insurance, your life insurance. And of course, it includes everything in your home, the coins in your under your couch cushions and the couch too, all of that is part of your taxable estate. There may also be things where you could think about asset protection. If you have renting a home, one or more, then you really may wanna think about, wait a minute, how do I make sure that if somebody trips and falls down the stairs, they don't sue me for everything I have? And so a limited liability company may be a way to do that. There are of course many, many other tools that can be used, but those are kind of the big ones. So let's deal with a number of questions now, as many as we can get to, and then we'll go back to the checklist here. Okay, so I've got a question, how much do you have to be worth before you have to go to probate? The ceiling used to be 2 million. Unfortunately, that's an incorrect uh, mixing. You're probably thinking of the ceiling of what is the estate tax limit. Anything below 2.2 million, no estate tax. For probate, if you have real property, any land, or you have more than $100,000 in value, then there will be a probate after you're gone. If it's less than that, then of course, there are other tools that might be able to be used. A probate is when your name is on things. Remember that. So if you have a living trust, for example, it, right, it can be over 100,000, of course, because what's in the probate doesn't have your name on it, doesn't have to go through probate. Question about guardianship of young children, forgive me, thank you for mentioning that. That could be both in your will, you wanna make sure you've listed your guardian in your will and have backups. 
generally it's better to have a guardian who's here in Washington state or at least a short-term guardian if it's there in Washington state, because a court is pretty reluctant to just immediately give up jurisdiction over a guardianship. So if you have, you say your brother lives in Albuquerque and they're the best for you, then at least designate someone here in Washington as a short-term guardian while the guardianship proceeding is ongoing that the children could live with. Uh, there's a question about if you have property out of state from Washington, if you put this property in a living trust, the answer is yes. All of it can go in a living trust in Washington. How do you select a lawyer to help set up a will and other documents? Well, gee, that's going to be hard. Um, really, what you want to do is talk to people that you trust, right? Maybe your financial planner, your neighbor, other people. Um, obviously, our information is here. Try to make sure when you talk to the attorney, are they going to give you maybe the first meeting is no obligation. That would be helpful. We do that because we don't want people to kind of, you know, be too reluctant to come in, right? We want to say, here's the meeting, let's go through what you want and then give you a fee quote. And at that point, you can say yes or no, or maybe. Uh, okay, there's a question on how can seniors on a limited income get a valid will? Um, that will be, uh, obviously you can co use some of those do-it-yourself plans or shop around. I'll be honest, our firm is not the cheapest. There will be probably other attorneys who uh, don't specialize in this area, that if it's a basic will, you know, maybe they're the, the place to go. Is a living will the same as a living trust? Great question, often a source of confusion. The answer is no. A living will is the same thing as a directive to physicians. A living trust is that other document that's an alternate to your last will and testament. It's unfortunate they're both named so close because it causes a lot of confusion, but you know that's kind of the, the, uh, the way it is. We generally will call it a directive to physicians so that there's not that confusion. Now, let's go to our checklist and then we'll see how much time we have left to answer other questions. Please do accept my apologies. I am, of course, going at speed. I want to make sure that you're not kind of on an endless Zoom call and wondering, when's this going to be over? You know, my show's coming on or <laughs> it's ready for lunch. Okay, so let's look at a checklist, right? If you were to say, gosh, I wish I had something at the end of the day to help me, you know, figure out what is it I should be doing. Uh, well, you want to check titling on your accounts. I'd say that's certainly one of the first things. Make sure that you understand what it is, whose name is on it. Is that what you wanted? If you have a living trust already, you definitely want to check the titling on your accounts. You will also be checking your beneficiary designations. It's not good, but it was often the case where I will have people who they, the dad died and he insisted everything was handled. Turned out he had never updated beneficiary accounts. I had a, some Boeing retirement accounts worth about four or $5,000. Boeing would not let them do anything to take control of that account because there were no beneficiaries that had been listed who were still living. We had to do a probate for that modest amount. So that wasn't 100,000, that was Boeing saying, no, you shall do this or else we're not gonna release the money. So the family kind of reluctantly said, okay, we'll do it. You wanna, if you do have a plan, I would encourage you to take it out. It's not uncommon. I will meet with people, they'll pull out their will or their other documents, kind of blow the dust off of it, open it up and go, wow, this needs to be changed. Our kids were four, our, our first daughter was just born and nobody else is on it, it's from 1997. So you wanna make sure you understand it, especially your will and your directive to physicians. Those have been, you know, there's a lot of different changes that are more current. You definitely wanna then provide that information, update it to, for your loved ones. And, you know, if you have an attorney, you, you feel like, hey, I'm comfortable with this person, just reach out to them for a checkup meeting. Make sure that that's something they can do. We're, of course, happy to meet with you if you'd like. I have people say, Mark, are you meeting with new clients? The answer is sure, of course, all the time. We don't have a specific, you know, narrow target audience that we're seeking. 
So you want to make sure you kind of understand that what's going to happen at that meeting. Hopefully they've sent you a questionnaire. They've said this first meeting is without obligation. And then you can talk to them first and get that information. See if you're comfortable at the end of the meeting. Say, this is a value to me. I want to do this. All right. So we'll look, look at a few more questions and then we'll turn to resources that might be available for you. We've got, and forgive me if I'm skipping, uh, I think the question is, should married couples file a joint will or set up a common living trust? Is it better to do one for each person? You can do a joint living trust. So here in Washington, a community property state, you can have one living trust for the couple. You can't have wills for both. So each person has their own will. And with married couples, you want to make sure that you're doing it and you understand what the ramifications are. Uh, you know, how the survivor may or may not be able to change things after you're gone. For estate tax purposes, the question says, how is personal property inside the house and garage valued? It's generally a guesstimate. But if it's worth any one item or collection is worth more than $3,000. So it might be heirlooms or coin collections or the car, right? There are other sources, whether it's Blue Book. I had a client who had vintage cars. We had to get an appraiser. The house itself, of course, is going to need to be appraised. If there's any heirlooms, antiques, artwork, this person also had a number of art design uh, you know, that we had to have those valued by an independent expert. So generally speaking, you're doing the best you can. Uh, but if there's anything worth a certain amount or over, then it really should be valued by someone who's uh, knowledgeable in that field. Should bank checking accounts need beneficiaries? Uh, generally, of course, it depends on your own plan. If you, you know, it may be better than having no one on it, but if you say, I've got three kids and I'm putting my daughter down on the, as the only beneficiary because I know she'll share it. Well, you die, she gets the money. Maybe she'll share it, maybe she won't. Maybe she doesn't like her siblings or maybe she's in the middle of a divorce and can't share it. And if she does share it, then she'll have some gift tax consequences she needs to think about as well. There's a question about should cars be included in a living trust? Generally, yes, if they're worth a lot. So if your cars are worth over a hundred grand, yes. Otherwise, no, they're pretty simple to transfer. Um, this usually means it's a really expensive car or it might be an RV. Those things probably we would want to look into whether it should be in the living trust. Um, what generally should someone plan to spend to work with an attorney in preparing these documents? It really depends on what you want. I would say we're, you know, there's going to be attorneys who charge all the way from a few hundred dollars to those who charge into the, you know, tens, twenties of thousands. We're probably going to be somewhere between those extremes, but it depends on what you're asking for. Right. If you just have a very, very simple, it's all the spouse community property agreement, then everything to kids, no bells, buttons or whistles, that'll be less expensive. If we're doing uh, estate tax planning to save tens, if not hundreds of thousands, that's more sophisticated. If we're doing a living trust, that's more sophisticated. And we partner, we partner with our clients to title assets, those kinds of things. Okay, so could you talk just a little bit about how one might look into setting up a foundation? This is a little far afield, I'd say on that one, you're going to be, you can do it through your will or your trust, but you're definitely going to want an attorney who answers those kinds of questions. We have an attorney here, actually two, uh, Jim Davies and Grace and Chester, and they focus on foundations. So that would be something to meet with them and say, this is what I'm thinking. You could set it up for life, or you could set it up for in your trust or your will after you die. Um, of course, charities, uh, you know, you can also work with the institution itself. Um, I'm sure that uh, Karen Sinney would be happy to walk you through the kinds of information and resources. Most charities will offer different kinds of planning tools for here's the kind of, uh, you know, beneficiary language we would like to have, or here's how we can work the different kinds of language that you might have. 
if it's a charitable remainder trust or whatever it happens to be. How to select an attorney is another question that we've got. I think you're trying to do exactly the, what you're doing. Learn more, right? So am I comfortable with this person? Will they give me uh, the opportunity to meet with them before they're charging? And, you know, do I feel like I've got a relatively easy is it and then make sure they give you a questionnaire it's not a bad plan at all to use the resources that were provided earlier in the screen show and i've also put some up here there's a couple really good books i believe uh at least one of them i think the jk lasser's new rules for estate and tax planning are available on both in both libraries I think estate planning smarts, I'm trying to remember, I think that may have been in King County. I'm, I can't remember if it's also in Seattle, but they're both kind of easy, relatively easy guides on here's how to go about with your planning. There are of course a host of resources. If you're looking for those resources um, in a book, anything like that, you're gonna wanna try to make sure that the older it is, the more you take it with a grain of salt. So that if it's a 2012 book uh, that hasn't really been updated, then you're going to want to say, well, maybe the, the tax and other information isn't ac entirely accurate. That doesn't mean that there won't be a lot of things that are the same. But as they get older, you probably want to be a little bit less likely to depend on them. And then, of course, most of these books aren't written in a community property state. They tend to be written for common law states where titling on husband and wife has much more of an impact. So if you see a book, right, you want to make sure that they've got something in there on community property jurisdictions and how does that work. Uh, I'd encourage you to consider looking on our website. I've gone through things pretty quickly. We have other seminars there. I've got a, what, a mini seminar on estate planning and living trusts and things like that. It's about 13, 14 minutes. And you could kind of use that as a, as a refresher. We have a, a, a handout, what to do when a loved one dies, that's also available on our website. But if you want to, you can just email that contact at reberglaw.com and we're happy to provide you with that as well. So all those things would be available for you if you need it. Now, uh, of course, this is not about me, right? It's not about us. If you feel like you've got an attorney, you have resources, start there. The most important thing is you want to start. If you don't, of course, then there are other kinds of resources available to you, including us, we're, we're more than happy to do that, but that's not the purpose for this meeting. It's to give you information and to make sure you understand your libraries are a tremendous resource for you on this and other topics. So before, if I have just a few minutes, then I'll give you some real life examples of what people have put in their wills. So one person said to my first wife, Sue, whom I always promise to mention in my will. Hello, Sue. Another person put in their will to my daughter, Helen. I leave the sum of $1 for the love and kindness she has never shown me. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the German poet Heinrich Heine left all of his assets to his wife, everything he owned to his spouse after he died on the condition that she remarry. Because then he said, there will be at least one man to regret my death. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I will hand it back to the hosts, I hope, and they can carry it forward from here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mark. That was that was wonderful. Those were some really special uh, <laughs> anecdotes you had at the end there. <laughs> um, our sincere thanks to Mark again for taking time out of his schedule to share information and ideas with all of you. Um, I really enjoyed all those Princess Bride references, and I hope you did too. Um, 
As a reminder, in the coming days, you'll receive a follow-up email from us uh, with the slides, the recording from today, and contact information for everyone you've seen on screen. Um, so look for that coming soon. There will also be a survey on today's webinar, and we really value your feedback. It's helping us shape our future programming. So please take two minutes and fill out this survey for us, and we would be most grateful. And I want to thank you all again for being part of our virtual events sponsored by the foundations for both uh, the Seattle Public Library and the King County Library System. And I want to remind you that charitable bequests are one of the most meaningful ways that you can support the nonprofits that you love, including the library. And both of our organizations have partnered with Free Will. Someone was asking a question about that earlier. This is a tool to provide the community with online resource to write a legally valid will or trust. It's 100% free and it's available online. It takes 20 minutes to complete and is, in va is valid in all of the 50 states. Um, as Mark mentioned, you know, if you have a complex estate plan, you may want to visit an estate planning attorney, but Free Will can actually help you create a set of documented wishes to take to that estate of plan attorney. And we're going to send a link to that in the follow-up email as well. And finally, if you ever have any questions or would like to continue this conversation, please reach out to myself or Cara. And thank you again uh, for attending today. Please take care and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.